No, Larry's um, 100% deaf, but actually, you probably won't guess it because he's incredibly good at moderating his, um, his, uh, his voice level. He's also good at lip reading, so now I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> um, Larry, um, the, the one significant thing I want to say about Larry is Larry's a person who's actually sponsored all of the design thinking books for today's conference um, out, of his own, out of his own money. He's that passionate about trying to get, you know, you talk about craftsmanship and, and people wanting, you know, really to, to just do good for the sake of good. Um, he sponsored the 200 um, design thinking workbooks for, for today. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Let me introduce you to the first glitch in the afternoon. I'm a deaf person. I hear absolutely nothing, including my own voice. If I get too loud, get too soft. And when we get to questions, I'd like to introduce Michael Lubeck, co-author, co-editor. He and I will be honored if you will take a copy of the book home with you, leave it on your desk, and try to explain it to a stranger, even your spouse. That was marketing for Valen and Wiley. Now marketing for Springer. 10 years of design engineering research at the doctoral level, Stanford and Hasse Plotner Institute, Potsdam. No giveaways, but it's all online. Okay, I'm gonna to try to deal with disaster today. Are we... Maybe we're getting audio. Are you presenting? He was on, yes? Yeah, it was. That was a challenge for all your system engineers. 30 years later, and we still can't get a presentation to work on time, on schedule. Okay, so please allow me to deal with disaster. One of the most important distinctions in language in my shop today is the distinction between forecasting systems models and foresight. And that's a working definition. Have any of you met a bear on your walk? Bravo. That was the 1% who met the bear. Were you ready? <laughs> he was, I think. <laughs> So this is absolutely about dealing with uncertainty, complexity, confusion, the unexpected. That's what we call disasters. And today, in my teaching, the human user is evaporating and being replaced by robots. And the example I'll share with you today is the most outstanding wow this year. So our curriculum and our attention to what design engineering is about is not brand new. Started over 60 year old years ago with John Arnold who got fired from MIT. Sorry, MIT. <laughs> For the last 35 years, we've been doing doctoral level engineering research 
into the nature of teamwork. I'll end my presentation with the most dramatic finding. If there are words on this slide, I'm silent. I'd like to do subtext here. If anyone in the room sees themselves in a management position, I want you to take home one three-letter word. It's the word let your people do versus tell. Our job as engineering designers is to actually create more ambiguity. Every new design is a new alternative future. We're the bad guy in systems engineering. So maybe it's already clear, but our research is focused on the human side of the human technology equation. We study technical people doing their job. And one of my doctoral students persisted in asking, why is it so hard for these damn engineers to learn how to do the right thing? His approach to the problem was to say there are four quadrants of knowing and doing that must be dealt with. He studied the performance of about 50 engineering teams in a curriculum that asked the teams to go into all four quadrants. This is the performance of a thanks guys team. They didn't get into all four quadrants. They didn't move back and forth flexibly. Thanks a lot, guys. This is the wild team. They got into all the quadrants, all the ways of thinking and doing. They moved back and forth between the quadrants and the language of the previous speaker, these are real craftspeople. And in the last couple of years, we've learned to demand much more of our engineering teams. Deliver wow for your design. Deliver a real functional system that's engineered. Wow and now deliver the new business model to take advantage of your first two wows. If you want a definition for wow, ask your neighbor. <laughs> this is a real project in my graduate curriculum sponsored by Volvo Construction and engaging a team of seven graduate students across two universities, Stanford and Blekjing University, Southern Sweden. Let's see if I can make the switch act quickly. This is the presentation pre developed by the students in June after working nine months on the project. Bad key. It 
Is there audio? I don't know. Nothing? We're plugged in. I'll make sure. I thought there was, but I don't know. I never hear these things. So that's the challenge from the company. Very wide open, allowing lots of room for creative engineering. This is Volvo's vision of the future. Sound? Maxed out on here. I think it's fine. The audio is usually bullshit. This is the real robot that the team came up with. The Stanford team made the device that couples to the robot. The Blaking team made the mobile Wi-Fi environment. Bad key again. Again, I think it's reading opportunity. So it's not quite clear from the slide, but the team decided, get rid of the humans. We're going to do it all with robots. A little more detail, I'll take longer. The two black boxes you see, one on the left developed at Stanford that feeds the robot, and the one on the right developed in Sweden find the robot. In both cases, I want to stress, they built real engineered systems that work and are testable and valid proofs of concept. That black box on the top is the battery going in to feed the robot construction vehicle. So in my language, they're feeding robots. Of course, you need to find the robot first. Then you can feed it. This is something the teams did especially well, the business case to cope with this new system. D 
dealing with all three uh, problem spaces is a defining feature of our curriculum. This is their foresight model of the future of this product innovation and its impact on the company. And what was particularly powerful for me was to say, of course, most innovations are of rather little value in the next one to three years. If it's a real breakthrough, it starts to pay off in 10, 30, 50 years. And they modeled this quantitatively. I like to share the story of that name on the top, Jenny Alsberg was the corporate liaison to the project. She's had three years of wow. And now she's been promoted to the head of innovation, Volvo Group Worldwide. So, do the right thing, get promoted. <laughs> Real people do this stuff. Real global collaboration, corporate and academic. I think that was the hint to go back to the other slides. That's not it, is it? So we refer to our environment as a team of teams, two different universities, a corporate partner, and every year we implement 10 to 20 projects of this team of teams variety. It's just visual candy of some of the universities we've worked with, over 30 so far. Some of the companies we've worked with, over 100 so far, virtually all industries. One of my favorites that I can't see up there is called Bellcorp, women's makeup. Mechanical engineers, really? And they reinvented eye makeup. It's in production now. This is your reading assignment. How many of you have seen Team of Teams? Several hands went up. It's a light read. Pick it up and, uh, online. Get the digital version for like 10 bucks. You finish it in two hours. But the shock to me was General Stanley McChrystal, who was the commander of U.S. Special Forces in Iraq and Afghanistan starting in 2004. He arrives with that organizational chart on the upper right, the ultimate command control military structure. In his first war story, he claims to have a hundred times the firepower of the enemy, but has more casualties in the first week. He gets the message that he better do something. <laughs> it takes him five more years to achieve the team of teams in the middle, but the U.S. Pentagon is still a holdout. The Pentagon demands three days to three weeks to okay hitting that guy. And that guy doesn't sit in this room for three days to three weeks. <laughs> this is the other reading assignment. 
In this case, Keith Dorst is a classic uh, industrial designer by training, and he has discovered that reimagining the problem at the framework level is much more valuable than redefining the problem at the component level. It's an excellent co-read, also on E. Both authors use these four words over and over again, almost ad nauseum, and we've been getting the word complexity today. But the other key words help explain why complexity is a changing scenario. I'd like to share one of our more striking research findings. The raw data is the video of people interacting. There should be audio, but I never hear it. Uh, you can see what they're saying in the subtext. And what the researcher did is come up with about 12 shorthand signs to describe the behavior of the team. So action on the left, described on the right. This was a team that was producing wow. So it's a good example. There are other videos I'm not sharing with you that we're producing. Thanks a lot, guys. I encourage you to read the textbook on blue. Those are the guidelines for improvisational theater. Improv theater is very popular in San Francisco. And that means no script, nobody telling anybody what to do next, figure it out. And those are the rules of behavior. Our researcher got trained as an improv theater person and then did his research. This is what the data looks like. Actually, if any of you do genetic modeling, it looks a lot like genetic code. And so, sure enough, we took that body of data to one of the big data places that does genetic algorithm to find patterns in genetic code. And this is their first big finding. If any one of you, in the next 10 minutes, will say yes and, there's an 86% chance that somebody you're talking with will volunteer another comment. The inverse is, is to say, yes, but. And the others can a ya abe. No better way to shut people down than abe. <laughs> so this is big, dramatic finding. And now I want you to take it home. I'm asking you to mimic what I do. Please grasp the science paradigm in your right hand. The only knowledge worth having in that paradigm is context independent. You all know that. Math, physics, maybe chemistry, not really biology. Useful. Can't violate it but it doesn't produce anything. In your left hand, you're holding the design paradigm. The knowledge you must have for that hand is context. I'm asking all of you to help me over the next 50 years balance the equation. Today, our societies spend about a thousand times more on science and tech than they do on the humans. It won't be easy, I assure you, and when we get there, 
It'll be an A-stable system because context keeps changing. Physics might be relatively stable. Thank you. <laughs> this graphic says science is good, but we've overinvested. And if we invest more in that left hand, we'll get more impact on our society. Balance the equation, please. This is our equation for success and breakthrough, human minds, human emotions, organizational structure, and the space they work in. They all matter, and we can now quantify all of them. Let's change the world. Thank you. Uh, Michael and I will be happy to take questions. Yeah. Do you want a microphone? Okay. I have one, thank you. Okay. Super. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to talk about the research from Larry and of course about the book project. So if there are any, any questions, please. I think it's the beginning quite hard because they're trained for the last 10 years in school, of course, in high school and university about different mindset. And uh, what we do actually in the beginning is having like kind of exercises so they learn a little bit how to collaborate, how to build prototypes, how to do radical collaboration. And uh, based on these learnings, they're much more open than for the second and third iteration. And actually, that's a big problem. <laughs> so um, usually in the US, you know, I have already kind of this attitude about failure and, you know, trying it again. And this is part of the DNA of the people. But if you go to China, for example, you know, they have a totally different system. Um, for them, you know, it's a big challenge um, to go into this kind of mindset, to go into this kind of collaboration. So um, there are cultural differences. And um, actually, what you can do, you can just um, build up great teams, so let's say, meet personally, build up friendships, you know, and this is actually also my succession for like um, large teams and big projects. If people know each other on a personal basis, um, everything runs great, you know, and that's the same for these projects. So we try to get everyone in one place, they meet, they hang out, they have beer together, you know, and this helps a lot in the next step and working together. Well, usually, um, first of all, all of them have to be a passion for the uh, vision they like to achieve. Those are the basics. But on the second hand, what we try to do, um, there's like models out, so like the HPDI profile, so that you have different kind of preferences of thinking. So we're trying to put uh, teams together. We have like really strong analytical skills, but on the other hand, like really strong skills and building up empathy with a customer or user. And uh, with mixed teams, you have like all these competences together in one team, and then actually it works quite well because someone takes over the lead, so organization of the team, someone's really great in having interviews with people, other ones are really innovative, and um, the last ca category are really into analyzing data and analytics. We measured, oh, sorry, we measured at Br University of Bristol, we measured the <coughs> belief that engineers, and these are some of the most selected engineers in the country, right, at coming out at master's level, uh, their belief in their creativity. And we found that their belief in their creativity was below national average. There is a major cultural problem in which we say STEM equals technical okay. and creativity equals 
emotion. And we've, that is, the, the measurement is in reality nonsense. Those engineers were producing really magnificently creative projects, but they didn't believe in their need to hone those skills. There, I can send you academic papers on that work, if you wish. Okay. Please be in contact. Thank you. <coughs> Can I take one minute? Uh, what I want to admit to you is that I just programmed your brain. I invite you to go home and share with a partner. You've been programmed. I used your mere neurons. And I'm a neuroscientist by training, not a mechanical engineer. Beware. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mikhail, as well. I really appreciate the help. Um, so we've got uh, a refreshments break now. I um, hope everybody enjoyed the, uh, the World Cafe. Um, sounded noisy, which is a good sign. Um, the results, like a summary of the results from the World Cafe, will be on display up here at 5 o'clock at the closing. So for anyone that didn't attend the World Cafe, you can see what people got up to. But um, no, otherwise, we're, um, we're back here at uh, 15.50 for our final session with Dave Snowden and I meant to uh, say, Professor forgive Kassel. me for leaving immediately, and I forgot. Thanks a lot. <laughs>